nice to welcome you to our morning service. I'm Mike Gillingham, one of the readers at uh, St. James's Church, and I'd like to welcome everybody who's here um, and all those watching online. And must remember our friends who may have gone to be with the other B1 churches at the joint celebration. This is going to be a communion service, so please feel welcome to join us at the table when we get to that part of the service. We're now going to have the gathering. Loving God, we have come to worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith, to sing your praise with gratitude, and to listen to your word with joy. In Jesus' name, amen. And we're going to sing now, come set your rule and reign. How are everyone's feeling energized for this? <clears throat> Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our us all from the very youngest to the very oldest. 
But our youngest ones are going to leave us now for a time together. So let's pray for them. Our loving Father, you are Father of us all. And we thank you for that. We pray now for those younger members of our congregation, that you would be with them as they go out to learn more about you and to praise you together. And we pray for their leaders too, that they would find joy in all that they're doing. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to the music group now. Good morning. So um, for our praise time, we have three songs that will prepare us as we wait upon the Lord, is that we know that strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. And our first song is Open Your Eyes, See the Glory of the King, Lift Up Your Voice, and His Praises Sing. I love you, Lord, I will proclaim. Alleluia, I bless your name. The splendor of the king clothed in majesty. How great is our God. We sing how great is our God. Let us stand as we praise.
And now we come to our readings. Please would you sit down and we will listen to Paul and Chris as they bring us our readings for today. Our first reading from the Old Testament this morning is from the book of Amos, chapter 5, reading verses 18 through to 24. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. It's not the day of the Lord, darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it. I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings, and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. Verses 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took their oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Oh, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No. There will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids uh, came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Jesus, we just sang that strength will rise as we wait upon you, our Lord and Savior. So help us to discern in this parable and in this passage of Amos what it means to wait and be ready. Open our eyes and our minds that we may follow you more faithfully. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, not very easy reading. Um, Amos, 
is the title in my Bible is The Day of the Lord. And, and the passage in the New Testament is all in a context of the Day of the Lord. So we will explore how those two passages help us understand what it means for us as Christians to be those who are readying ourselves to his coming. If you remember last week, um, we had a great talk from Ed who explained about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like. And he started with uh, a comparison in the scripture is the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, but we are not really used to mustard seed in our context. So he used the acorn because we understand something very little that if it's planted in the right condition, can grow up to a mighty oak tree. And for me, the kind of interesting part was when he said, it's not just about something small that grows big, it only can grow big if it's in the right condition. In the right conditions. The acorn only becomes an oak when it's planted in a fertile soil, gets all the nutrients, the water that it needs, and it's protected so it can grow. And the same with the yeast and the dough. The yeast by itself can't do much. It needs the right environment, that dough, so that it can expand. And for me, it was a challenge. Am I creating the right environment in my life for the kingdom of heavens to grow? And are we as a church creating the right environment for the kingdom of heaven to grow? Then there were two others, which was about the treasure and the pearl, the kingdom of heaven. When we start discovering it, it's exciting. We're ready to sell everything for it. It's not sacrifice, it's joy. Pure joy because we see Jesus among us, his life, his empowering so today, how then do we ready ourselves? How do we prepare ourselves, make us, ourselves more available to what God wants to do in us and through us? So we start with this very harsh passage in Amos. Amos the prophet. And you see there a little picture. Mine is always cut, so I might have to um, um, turn around to, to see. But he just show, you see on, on the left side, you have this little man there. He's a shepherd. Amos was a shepherd living there in Tekoa, and he was right at the border between the north and the south of the kingdom of, uh, of Israel, not Israel, the Jewish nation, who by that time was divided into two kingdoms, the south being Judah and the north being Israel. And in the north there was a king called Jeroboam II. And they were in a time of prosperity. This king um, kind of was good in battles, and he got a few more territories. Yeah! And it was wealth. But the problem is that it was wealth for certain people, and not for all. And the big problem is that he was not worshipping the God of the Jewish God, the God of Israel, or the word called Israel. He had a mixed heart, and he went to all kind of other gods, He was actually one of the worst king that Israel had. And Amos then went up to, from Tekoa to Bethel with a message. And so this book of Amos that we have are kind of the collection of his sermons, his poems, and his vision to Israel and to the nations around. And here we have what Jews of Jesus' time would have understood by the day of the Lord. But I think they had forgotten, like those in the day of Amos had forgotten. They thought the day of the Lord will be a day of deliverance. God will deliver us from our enemies because we are the good guys and all the other ones are the bad ones. And Amos says, no, you are the bad ones at the moment. You are disobeying God. You are creating injustice. Yes, there is wealth, but there is great poverty, and you are oppressing the people among you, the poor, the lonely, the lost. The day of the Lord, here it says, is not a day of deliverance and of joy, it's a day of darkness for you. 
because I'm tired of your superficial religiosity. Yes, you go through the motions, yes, you have the temple, but it's so mixed with all kind of other things that I've never asked you to do. And it's mixed with idolatry. You see, they had a call to be light, to be salt to the world. They had received a law, they had received something amazing that would constitute them as a nation that was different from all the other ones. They had received a land and they were called to worship God in a certain way. But they had mixed heart. So he goes and he tells the series of poems. Now, I have this little game with my children. Um, we tried to find a sentence, a memorable sentence of a film, of a movie, and then we have to find out oh, which movie does it come from. So if I say, with great power come great responsibilities, and Nadia, you're not allowed to tell anything. With great power come great responsibilities. Which film does it come from? Spider-Man. Well done, good, Spider-Man. That's what the uncle says to, um, to Peter in the car. With great power come great responsibility. Well, the, people, the, the, the Jewish people had received a great calling and a great responsibility. And by sinning, by turning their backs to, from God, there were going to be great consequences. Here is what God says to Israel. I choose you, Israel, from among all the families of the earth, and this is why now I will punish you for all your sins, because you are not being the light. You are not being the sword. A good God has to punish evil. It has to show to everybody this is wrong. And so the day of the Lord for them was a day of darkness. And a few decades, about 40 years after Amos' um, talks and sermons and poems and vision and ministry, Israel was taken away from their land in exile by the Assyrian. And all their buildings and temples and places of worship were completely destroyed. And for us, it's important to understand because that's what Jesus was telling about the day of the Lord in his time. They had that in their history. They knew what had happened to Israel first and then to Judah. They knew about the exile. They knew about the destruction of the temple and their way of worshipping. And so when we go to our New Testament... We have this story in Matthew 25 of those, the parable of the ten, sometimes it says ten virgins, sometimes ten young women. Um, but it's in the context, if you look and have a look uh, after this Sunday, it's in the context of Jesus speaking about the end of times, but more particularly about the coming, the day of the Lord. And so we'll unpack that. What does it mean to be ready? And what it meant for them to be ready? You see, the problems with the northern kingdom was all this idolatry. They were worshipping false god, And in their days was the god of sex, the god of weather, and the god of war. Now, I'm not sure about today, the God of weather, whether we're still worshipping that. Although I must confess, I probably check too often uh, the weather forecast, and maybe I think too much about the weather. But of course, the God of sex and lust, the God of power, the God of money, the God of popularity and success, they're all very much alive in our day and age, in our Western society. And the problem with worshipping false God, it always brings injustice always bring oppression because false gods don't require right living they don't require justice they don't require right standards and so what is our calling now today as a church what was the calling 
at the time of Jesus when they said, you need to be ready. The day of the Lord is coming. And some won't be ready. And some will. And so we looked at those 10 um, young women. And you have the story of them carrying some lamps and a wedding. So again, I need to give you a little bit of background because we had a wonderful wedding here on uh, Friday. And some of you might have uh, known Michael Harewood because he grew up here from very, very young. And so it was a wonderful. But of course, the way we do weddings well, have all kinds of traditions. So for example, on the day of the wedding, and uh, the groom is not allowed to see the bride, you know, and the bride is with her little party, and the groom is with his little party, and he comes here very early, and he should stand there, and he should not look back. What wasn't in the case in the Jewish context. It was very different. So to understand this uh, parable, you need to understand how weddings worked. And in a nutshell, you had the groom, who, let's say he lived here, that's the groom in his house, with his friends and his family, and that's where the party was going to take place. But the groom had to leave his house to the house of the bride. So he goes that day, and he goes and gets his bride. So he was allowed to see the bride, not like today. He goes with his most probably best friend or a group, go to the bride, find the bride, and then brings the bride back to his house, because that's where the party was going to take place. But they would do that journey and try to make it as long as possible. Because as they go through the streets of the towns or the village, it would be just a celebration. So they would go back. So I mean, back in the camera, there we go. Hello. There we go. And it would take time. And that's why in that story, you have this idea of um, the groom the readiness. So I need to turn because I can't see in that, that screen. So, but you have this text that we just had. And I just show, sometimes it's helpful when you read out a text, put some colors and try to understand. So, so in this text, you have an expectation. You know, meet the groom because that's the final. That's where the party is going to take place. And people were waiting to see the groom and the bride by that time coming back. And because there was not enough space in the house, some people were in the streets waiting. And that's where those young women were. They were waiting for finally the party to go to the house. And that was the expectation. And so you have ten then young women. Five are dull or dim-witted or foolish in our text. They don't have any extra oil. And five are thoughtful. They have extra oil. But all fall asleep. It's, you know, they take a long time. Then they hear that He's coming. They're there, not just the groom, the bride. The whole party is there. So they all arise, but the dull and the dim-witted have no oil. And the thoughtful have. So they're ready. The other ones have to go back, find oil, and, and because they had this waste of time, finally the party was in the house, everyone was in, the door was shut. So when the dull were finally ready, they were not able to enter. How many of you went yesterday to Bridgewater Carnival? Oh, we have a lucky one there, a lucky one. I was trying, how can I compare to the Bridgewater Carnival? Now, as good English, you know that you have to be ready for all kind of weather. So imagine you go on your way, and it's sunny, and you say, wow, this is amazing, it's November, it's sunny, I'm going to go in short and in shirt, and yeah, I'm going to enjoy. And it takes you a good hours to get there. And you realize, you know, you're in the crowd, so you, you get there very early because you need to be in front of the crowd, you know, by the street, so it takes there about two hours before. And then the, the sky starts changing, it's getting really cold. You realize you don't have your umbrella, you don't have jackets, you know, you don't, have, you don't have a seat. You have an umbrella, there we go, you don't have a seat. And you just can't stand, it's just too cold, it's too wet, it starts raining. And, uh, and, uh, but your friends, they were ready, they, they have their umbrella, they have their waterproof jackets, they have their sweater, they have their little chairs, and they're enjoying themselves. And so you have to go back. And by the time you're back again, 
The crowd is so much, you can't even see now, because the crowd is, you know, you can't go through. And you're late. The parade's gone. Now, your friend who was ready said, well, it's your fault. You knew. You should know better. You're from England, you know. You might say, you know, I excuse you, you're from Belgium, you know, maybe you don't know or whatever, but, <laughs> but you have no excuse. You should have known. You're from England. You should be ready. And I think something of that happened. Five were foolish because they should have known better. They were informed. They knew it would take some time. So five had enough to continue and to get to the party. The context is that a woman at a time in the darkness always had to have a lamp for their own security, but also so that people could recognize, so that no one could say, oh, someone sneaked out and you know, did something you know, a bit spooky or not very good. So usually they would wear their lamp very close to their face so they could be recognized. So it was foolish not to have enough. There was no way they could then walk in the dark. They had to have their lamp for their own protection. So what is this warning about? Be ready. Be watchful. If you look at the whole context, there are actually, it looks like, two days of the Lord. And I won't actually say there are many days of the Lord, but there was one very actual that was very close to Amos, which Jesus prepared the Jewish nation, and that was actually just for them. And that was the realization that the temple was going to be destroyed. And that's because through Jesus, God was starting something new and he wanted Israel to be ready to recognize that God is through Jesus now the new temple and was going to do something new. And the old ways was going to be destroyed because it didn't work. Because Israel was again in the same way, creating injustice, not looking after each other, the poor, the widow, and the foreigners. They were like in the time of Amos. And so if you look at Matthew, you will see that Jesus, in that context, speaks about first the temple. Jesus left in just verse, uh, chapter 24, left the temple and was uh, walking away with his disciples, came up to him to call his attention to his, this building, to its building. Do you see all these things? He asked, truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another everyone will be thrown down. So like Amos, Jesus was predicting a destruction. That's the first day of the Lord. And it happened in 70 AD when Israel, Jerusalem was besieged and the temple was destroyed and many were not ready. But there is another way also, another kind of day of the Lord, which is the final time when God then will not just judge Jerusalem, or in the time of Amos, Israel's, but judge the whole world, all the nations, past and present. That will be the great day of the Lord, when he will bring about justice and renewal and new creation. And that day, we don't know when it's going to happen. Jesus says then, keep watch, because you do not know the day the hour. Even Jesus himself on earth didn't know, only the fathers. So what in this passage? I don't like the word learn because parables are more about impressions. They're stories that want you to make think, to think. You need to kind of digest them and work through them. But they're a different place, and some would say, well, there's only often one uh, message in the parable which kind of disagree. There are various ways to let this parable encourage us, challenge us, and help us to be more ready. First, well, the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is already here, but not fully there yet. And it's going to take some time. So as disciple, commit to the long haul. There is no instant discipleship, no instant maturity in the Christian life. You need to be wise. 
You need to make wise decisions. You need to think and be prepared. It took longer. Five were not prepared, and five were. Secondly, and I have something like this, yeah. 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 Take the long view. Take the long view first. Secondly, the question of borrowing resources. So the foolish one says, well, we don't have enough. Give a little bit of your oil. And I said, well, no way, we can't give it, because if you give, we don't have enough for ourselves. Now, discipleship doesn't happen on an island. We need each other to grow. We need the Sundays to be encouraged. To be, we need to meet during the week, whether it's home groups or whether you have some prayer groups, or we need that encouragement. But at the same time, you cannot borrow your own preparation to the kingdom. Your commitment and your discipleship, you cannot loan it to someone else or borrow it. You have to make decisions yourself about your own walk with God. What did I say? Take responsibility for your spiritual growth. That's our task, my task. Third, reaction to failures. They made a mistake, those foolish women, young women. And what was their reaction? They shouted at their friends, Give us! We don't have enough. Not only that, they even shout at the Lord. They knock on the door, Lord, Lord, open! It's so easy when we make mistakes to blame others, to point the fingers at others. As Christians, we need to learn to own up when we do make mistakes. We need to, someone says, barking orders at others is not an acceptable way to try to solve problems created by our own inadequacies. Well, this is hard. But we need to own up. Sometimes we need help when we make big mistakes. But we are the ones to make those choices. I think this passage speaks also of Jesus' disappointment. He wished they would all be ready. But he very, know, very well known that they won't. He came and lots of people were ready and they didn't look like the people who would have been ready. So he was born and shepherds came to worship him. Foreigners came from far away to worship him. But the Jewish leaders didn't recognize his birth. And throughout his ministry, it looks all the wrong people were open to his message and his ministries, but not the religious leaders, not the Sadducees, not the Pharisees. They were not ready. So it's a warning for us too. Let us be prepared. And then it's a challenge and a warning for his coming, because Jesus is coming. And if he's not coming in our lives, we will go to him, because we'll all die. And in a sense, that's our meeting of the Lord when we die. So we will all meet him, whether in our lifestyle, in our lifetime, if he comes in our lifetime, or whether when our time is up and we will meet him. So what does it mean to be ready? And maybe the most difficult is this final part. The door was opened for a time and then it was shut. And they came and they knocked, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. And he replied, truly I tell you, I do not know you. But there is an interesting, it looks like in um, Middle East, I do not know you is not the final answer. It could be to prompt the readers to say, wake up, it's still time. But also there will be a time when the door will be shut. And that's not easy. Some believe in what we call universalism, that at the end, you know, all things will be right, and I don't. There's too much material in Scripture and in Jesus' teaching that says uh, otherwise. And so how we respond to the proclamation that Jesus is the Son of God, how we respond to his claims on our lives, how we work out his teaching, day by day, will have eternal consequences. 
And we do not need to fear when we open ourselves to Jesus because he is the good shepherd. He will come in. He will transform us. But he asks us also our commitment. You see, God loves the world. God loves so, the world so much that he gave. That idea of love is God is loyal to his promises. God is loyal to his world. He wants to rescue it. But he asks our loyalty in return. That's what Israel had, was all about, loyalty. Follow what God had asked them to do. And as Christian, we are also now called to be loyal to him. And so Paul will write to the Philippians, and I will end with that. Live in responsive obedience, he says. Better yet, redouble your effort. Be energetic in your life of salvation. Reverent and sensitive before God. Because that energy is God's energy. An energy deep within you. God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure. So go out into the world and corrupt it. A breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Carry the light, giving message into the night. That's from the message translation, Philippians 2, 12 to 14. So carry the light like those ready five young women. Carry the light, giving message, the good news of Jesus. Show it through your life that it is transforming you, that it is making a difference in your life in your family. But more importantly, that's the call of St. James as a church, to be those responsive, obedient, listening to God, finding that energy that God wants to give us to be more and more in tune with his purposes and his plans. It is God's work in us and through us. It's not our work in our own strength. It's God's grace. It's God's life. God's faithful commitment to us. And he will give us, give us the energy to be ready, to stand firm. Let's pray. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light on my path. Jesus, we want to be more like you in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, and in our daily choices. We stand by faith in your unfailing loyalty towards us. By your Spirit, strengthen us to be loyal to you. Amen. So this morning also stand on behalf of um, Vicky who found uh, quite difficult. So we'll pray for you, Vicky, because you're struggling with, um, with eyesight. So, um, and, um, so I'll do the prayers too. And I chose the Lord's Prayer. We've explored that through the summer. Uh, but I've been given by uh, someone in the church a, a challenging way to look at the Lord's Prayer. And I'm going to gentle use that for us um, and for you to be responsive in your own quiet time. It's called, actually, I cannot pray, going through the Lord's Prayer. I cannot say, ah, if my faith has no room for others and their needs. And I cannot say, Father, if I do not demonstrate this relationship in my daily life. And I cannot say, who art in heaven, if all my interests and pursuits are in earthly things. So our Father, who art in heaven, help us to see others the way you see them. Help us to walk with you as a good Father who knows our needs and to trust in your faithfulness and loyalty. And help us to put your interest above and beyond mine and ours. 
your kingdom come, your will be done. I cannot say, hallowed be thy name, if we who are called by his name are not holy. And we cannot say, thy kingdom come, if we are unwilling to give up our own sovereignty and accept the righteous reign of God. And we cannot say, thy will be done, if we are unwilling or resentful of having it in our lives. So, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So, our Father, we continue to pray for your kingdom to come here at St. James, in this town, and especially this morning as churches from across the town are gathering together in Wellington. May they sense your presence and hear your voice afresh. Lead your church in this land and across the world to be those who shine your light and who are the salt of this earth. And especially we pray for all the places in conflicts where your church is a witness. Strengthen them. Give them courage. May there be those who are good news to dark places. Your kingdom come, your, your will be done. I cannot say, or we cannot say, on earth as it is in heaven, unless we are truly ready to give ourselves to his service here and now. So let us pray for all those who are serving others. And this morning we especially pray for the NHS, for all the doctors and the nurses who've been working so hard, who feel tired, and who seems to have the only resort left to go on strike because they feel not recognized. Lord, help us in our own way when we meet people who are caring for others, whether it's in the NHS, whether it's in care homes, whether it's personally at home, to be people of encouragement, to say thank you, to recognize their work. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And we cannot say give us this day our daily bread without ex pending honest effort for it or by ignoring the general needs of our fellow people. And we cannot say forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us if we continue to harbor a grudge against others. So let's take a moment in your own quietness to think about places where people are looking after the needs of others. And maybe take this time to think about your own place. Are you holding a grudge against someone? Your kingdom come, your will be done. And so Lord, we cannot say lead us not into temptation if we deliberately choose to remain in a situation where we are likely to be tempted. And we cannot say deliver us from evil if we're not prepared to fight in the spiritual realm with the weapon of prayer. We cannot say thy kingdom come if we don't, do not give the king the discipline obedience of a loyal subject. We cannot say thine is the power if we fear what our neighbors and friends may say or do. Or thine is the glory if we are seeking our own glory or forever if we're too anxious about daily affairs, or amen if we can't honestly say, cost what it may, this is my prayer. So let's pray for those who are anxious today. This morning we lift up to you Grace, who is currently in an induced coma, 
We pray you will come by your Holy Spirit to restore her to health. And we ask in the name of Jesus to strengthen Sharon and all those who are surrounding Grace at this time. And we pray for Guy following the death of his uncle and for the whole family. And in a time of quietness, do pray for those you know who need strength, healing, and guidance. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord of the Church, hear our prayer and make us one in heart and mind to serve you with joy forever. Amen. As we come to the Lord's table, we must prepare ourselves and we do so by confessing what we have done wrong and asking for mercy, knowing that our, our Father is running on the road to meet us, to forgive us. God our Father, you come to meet us when we return to you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus Christ, you died on the cross for our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Holy Spirit, you give us life and peace. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, we thank you for your promise of forgiveness. We pray that you would send your Spirit so that we may live closer to you. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to share the peace. Peace to you from God, who is our Father. Peace from Jesus Christ, who is our peace. Peace from the Holy Spirit, who gives us life. The peace of the triune God be always with you. And also with you. Please do share the peace. Good, good. So let's remain standing, but if you feel the need to sit down, please do so. So we are here together to celebrate the loyalty of God towards his creation, who by sending Jesus to die for our sin, has opened a way for life, forgiveness, and peace. The Lord is here. God, our creator, loving and faithful, holy and strong, we give you thanks and praise. You made us and the whole universe and filled your world with life. You send your Son to live among us, Jesus, our Savior, Mary's child. He suffered death. He died to save us from our sins. And he rose in glory from the dead. Father, on the night before he died, he shared a meal with his friends. He took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And after the meal, he took the cup of wine and he thanked you and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the new promise of God's unfailing love. Do this to remember me. And so together we say, Christ Jesus died. Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus Christ will come again. Father, as we bring this bread and wine and remember his death and resurrection, send your Holy Spirit that we who share these gifts may be fed by Christ's body and his blood. Together we say, pour your Spirit on us that we may love each other, work for the healing of the earth, and share the good news of Jesus as we wait for his coming in glory. 
For honor and praise belong to you, Father, with Jesus, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. And Jesus taught us to call God our Father. So in faith and trust we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one prayer. So you are all invited to participate in this meal. There will be prayer ministry by that flag there. We tried to move it away from the back, so it's a little bit uh, more um, uh, kind of um, calm, I would say. So the kingdom of God is among us, and Jesus is alive. And he can bring healings of body, mind, and spirit and he can be there for you. So if you want prayer ministry, make your way to that place um, and um, then there will be two stations for and you will be guided through the process. So if I can ask all who are helping me first to come and we'll start with communion and also those doing prayer communion and the, um, Ruth uh, and Ray and yeah. <coughs> Jesus, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Continue your work of transformation from within that we might shine your love, your grace, your mercy and your truth in this world. Amen. Amen. So just uh, two notices. Uh, Sue, Sue is around. Thank you very much. Hello, so most of you will have seen the big quiz night uh, information. Uh, so Saturday, yesterday, two weeks, Saturday in the 19th at 7.30 in the church hall, everybody's invited to join us for a big quiz night. Um, you may, uh, no, no. yeah, so lots of other churches are running it, uh, also around the country, so we'll be able to find out how many others are quizzing at the same time. Uh, if you'd like to bring your own drinks, glasses, and snacks, 
but there'll be hot drinks to buy on the night. The entry charge is only two pounds each. Tickets will be on sale today and next Sunday uh, and on the door. And I invite you to bring your friends in a team of four to six or to join a team on the night. <clears throat> so during the evening, there'll be a short film to learn a bit more about Tear Fund, about the work of Tear Fund and an opportunity to donate. So please bring your checkbooks or cash or your phone if you wish to use Just Giving via the QR code to give generously. I hope lots of people will come uh, and I could use a few more helpers to help set up, welcome people and clear up afterwards. So please see me afterwards with any offers of help. Thank you very much. So Tear Fund have produced a brilliant quiz which should be a lot of fun and there'll be some local questions as well. So it's a good opportunity to invite people who don't normally come to church. Thank you very much. So is there, is there something else on the... No, I don't think I so. Yes, there is. If you, if you click, if you click, then yeah, there we go. Um, and then um, another one is a service of thanksgiving for Hillary Bromley on Friday the 25th, so Friday the 25th at 2.30 here in the church as we seek to celebrate her life. Um, there is another wedding coming up, so I need to publish some bands today. So I publish the bands of marriage uh, between Jack Edward Bryant Turner of uh, Norton Fitzwarren Parish and Nicola Jane Forbes of Norton Fitzwarren Parish. This is the first time of asking, so if any one of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it. I see that uh, Nicola is very relieved, <laughs> but it's also each time a great time for us to pray for you and for Jack. Let's take a moment. Heavenly Father, marriage is a gift from you to creation. So we pray for Jack and Nicola, that as they in uh, commit each other in that way of life, they will be a blessing for each other and a blessing for your community. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we come to our final song, Great is the Darkness, but in case that sounds awful, come Lord Jesus.
And so the words of the dismissal. Lord, you are hope. Transform us anew. Lord, you are freedom. Transform us anew. Lord, you are love. Transform us anew. Go with the strength of the Lord to love and serve him. Amen. Enjoy your Sunday and the rest of the week, if you can. And love to see you here next week.